Have you ever asked yourself, does life really matter? Turn to your neighbor and say, does life really matter? It does not. If you take God out of the equation in life, does life really matter? It does not. If you take God out of the equation in life, the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Who says that? Foolish people. It is God who gives meaning and purpose and fulfillment to life. Knowing God's promise for life cannot be compensated for knowing success, wealth, or fame. Knowing God's purpose in life cannot be compensated. Just to learn how to be successful, how to be wealthy, how to have fame. Without God's value for life, life is meaningless and vexation of spirit. The wisest man that ever lived upon the face of this earth said it. Who is he? Solomon, King Solomon, the book of Proverbs and Ecclesiastes are written by him. There are great counsel in there, great instructions to teach you to know how to, to understand life. Everything God created has a purpose and can find fulfillment. Listen to this. Everything God created has purpose and can find fulfillment. If you don't find that, listen, God's missing in your life. If you're sitting there and you're saying to yourself or you've said to others, I don't find a purpose for life, I don't find meaning, I don't find fulfillment in life, then you, are, you, you don't have God in your equation of living. You're missing God in your life because everything God created has purpose and can find fulfillment. And so the question is this, why did God create man and redeem man from his sinful nature? Why? If there is, and what is, what is the purpose for God to create you and then know that you had fallen into sin and to come and to die for you and to redeem you and to give you a life. Why? For what purpose? What is that purpose for him to do that? Because everything that God does has purpose and fulfillment, to bring fulfillment. Reason number one is this. We are born and redeemed for God's pleasure. We are born and redeemed for God's pleasure. God's pleasure. Two words to describe it. It's a love affair. To live for the pleasure of God is to have a love affair with him. One word to describe that love affair is worship. Two words to describe pleasure is love affair. One word to describe it is worship. God wants you to worship him. That's why he created you. And when you fell or when you were born into sin, he redeemed you that you might worship him. Worshiping God is a love affair. Worshiping God is to find time with him. Worshiping God is to have him the priority in your life. Worshiping God is giving God time. 
And when you give God time, you give the house of God the time to be there. In worshiping God, you give God the time to be early in that worship so that you can worship him in spirit. Finish it. And in truth. Have you come to worship him? Or you came to play religion? Everybody goes to temple. That is religion. Saw the newspaper and the news was the typhoon. Does it break your heart to see people trying to please their God in the way and the things that they do? But God saved you. He has taken all that punishment. You saw what they did on Typo someday, the, the, the things that they did to their bodies, thinking that what they did, either as something to please, to please, or to find, to find God's approval so God can bless them. And so they go through all of those afflictions, saying to God how much they appreciate what God has done for them or what they are looking forward for what God, that, for what they want God to do for them. I don't know. you realize the blessing of being a child of God. And you say, God, that's not what you desire of us to do, to go once again to punish ourselves, but you say, God, live in us that we may declare whatever that, that I need to, to, to please you or to be able to come to you. You have already provided for me and my business, Lord, is to live a life that testifies of saving grace, God's mercy, God's goodness. We are born and redeemed for God's pleasure. It's a love affair. Worship him. I don't know when we were singing. Did you sing? Or is it for those that can sing? There's no voice, no matter what your voice is, whether you can sing in tune or out of tune, sing. It pleases God, it glorifies God. Number two, we are redeemed to belong to God's family. We are redeemed to belong to God's family. We are not just believers. We are belongers. We belong. You're not here. You didn't come in here and you accept Christ and now you're faithful. It's not something that you, it's just happened. You belong. God has brought you into this place for a purpose. Not just to come and warm your seat. You are a belonger. Listen to Hebrews 10 verse 25 says this, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Friends, the day is approaching. What day is, is this? The soon return of Jesus Christ. Everything points to that. And as we see that day approaching, how much we need to come together as often as possible, the Bible says. Why? That we might worship. You say, but pastor, we, it, all we do is just come and worship. You know, it, how is that happening? Because worship brings you in line, which I want to close towards the end of the service, into abiding in him that empowers you and transforms you. 
worshiping brings you in line that transforms you and empowers you. We are redeemed to be Christ-like. That's his purpose. That you might be like him. And that's why the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he's a what? A new creature. Another translation says a very peculiar cre uh, uh, creature. Very different. We're not like the rest. And if somebody ever says to you, you're so different from us, say you're absolutely right. You know why I'm so different? I am born again. I have a new nature. That which I used to love to do that is displeasing and con contrary to the ways of God, I don't do them anymore. That which is now pleasing and honoring to Christ, that I do because I have been born again. Changed by the power and the glory of God. I've got to hurry. We are redeemed to serve God. God redeemed you, created you and redeemed you for all of these reasons, at least five that I presenting to you. He has redeemed you so that you can serve him. To serve is to minister. We all have ministries. Turn to your neighbor and say, you have a ministry. Come on. And turn to the other person on the other side and say, you have a ministry. A ministry is using your gifts and talents God has given to glorify his name. That's what ministry is. Whatever you do, if somebody says, praise be to God for you, it's because you use your talent, you use your gifts. If somebody says to you, what a blessing you have been, you know what they are saying? You are using the gifts and the talent God has given to you. That's why you're a blessing. Oh, I really appreciate you. It's because God has given you the talents, the giftings that you can bless somebody. And then you can tell them, you know why I'm a blessing? Do you know why? Do you know why I, I, I seem to be so good to you? It's because God has talented me, gifted me, blessed me. And out of me flows that it is not natural because the natural man is selfish. The natural man doesn't want to bless you. The natural man wants to keep the blessings all to himself. The natural man doesn't want to give. The natural man wants to keep. He is born that way to keep what he has, not give. Lastly, number five, we are redeemed to fulfill God's great commission. God's great commission. And that is we must be witnesses. We must be missionaries. When I say that, some of you are saying, oh boy, is God, is pastor telling me to go to Africa? Because he says we must be missionaries. No, you can be a missionary where you are. Your mission field is your neighbor. Your mission field is the office where you work. Your mission field are the friends that you have who don't know Jesus. That's your mission field. You're a missionary. You're a witness to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Now this leads me to my key thoughts for this morning and that is the secret of being fruitful. Having said that, I bring you to my key thought which is the secret of being fruitful. Jesus always used parables and nature to teach biblical truths 
You, you read the gospel. Very often he, he used parables. He told stories. He, he, he took uh, what he saw in nature. And from that he began to help people understand what the kingdom of God is. Because it's two different worlds. You have to understand it in your world, what the, Nick, what the spiritual world is. And so he tries to tie these together to give you a little understanding or a glimpse of what, he, what the kingdom of God is. And here he tells a very beautiful, taking nature and using nature as a way to communicate a, a very essential truth that you and I, who is called, who has life, given by God, and whatever God has created and redeemed has a purpose. And he brings that purpose in this beautiful teaching of John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. I'm going to read all of that, so follow me as I read. If you brought your Bibles, please look at your Bibles. Otherwise, watch the screen. John 15, 1 to 8 says this, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Another translation says the husband man. Every branch in me does not bear fruit. He takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. That can be a message in itself. The pruning of the master. The pruning that it may bear more fruit. The pruning is not destructive. The pruning is not destructive. It is not to hurt you. The pruning is that you may, that you may produce more fruit. You may, be pru- you may be bearing fruit, but, you, but he wants you to have more fruit. Verse 3. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. And the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you. In other words, without abiding, the secret of fruit bearing is simply this, abiding. And I'll talk about this a little bit as we move along. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot. Bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you, unless you abide in me. You say, oh, pastor, how can I be successful in my purpose in life for what God has saved and created me and redeemed me? How can I be If you want to fulfill God's purposes, it's got to be done God's way. And he's using this beautiful teaching from the vine, from nature. And then in verse 5, he says, I am the vine. Who are you? You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. You see, there's more fruit. There's fruit, there's more, and there's much. Where are you? There's also no fruit. You may be a branch, but but you don't have any fruit. It's possible. You could be in church and you're fruitless. There are many churches that, there are many people in churches today, they are a branch, but there's no fruit. I'm going to say that again because I think you missed me. There are many people in church today. They are a branch. But there's no fruits on them. And they're so happy because they're a branch. But you see, he didn't just redeem you just to be a branch. He wants you to find fulfillment as a branch. 
He wants you to find the purpose of being a branch. Verse 6. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire and they are burnt. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. But by this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. How do you glorify your father? How do you please your father? How do you have that love relationship with your father develop and grow and that he really appreciates every time? You meet with him and he meets with you. Every time as you walk into this, this auditorium, he says, oh, I'm so glad that I can have some fellowship, real close fellowship, and listen to his, his worship, his singing, his praises, and his giving of himself, and his seeking after me. Oh, I long to touch him and bless him. How many of you know he was already here before you got here? Can somebody say amen? You came late. He was earlier than you. God was waiting for you. Did you know that? Turn to your neighbor and say, God was waiting for you. Why so late? <laughs> huh? He was waiting for you. He was looking out for you. He looked out for some and some are not here. And when he saw you walking in, he smiled and said, oh, today I'm going to have fellowship with you. I'm going to pour into him the branch of my spirit, my grace. I'm going to pour into him the comfort that he needs. I'm going to pour into him the joy that seemed to have rubbed him because of life's challenges. I'm going to pour into him faith as he opens his heart to receive the word, for faith comes by hearing. I'm going to pour faith into his heart because there are things he needs to believe God for. And as he listens to the word, I'm going to give him faith to believe that with God, all things are possible. Can somebody say amen? He loves you. He loves you. Worship is a love relationship. Wake up and say, oh, I'm so sad. Today is not Sunday, it's Monday. Some of you wake up and say, ay, yeah, Sunday. <laughs> Nine o'clock service, only day I can sleep, and oh, it's Sunday. <laughs> no, I don't think you say that. The vine is Jesus, the husbandman is, or the, or the vine dresser is God, the branch is you, the fruit is what brings meaning and purpose to existence. The fruit brings meaning, brings purpose for you as a branch. And it is God's desire that you are fruitful, that you bear fruit. In Matthew chapter 13 and verse 8, you find that there are different degrees of success. There is a 100%, there is a 60%, there is a 30%, and then there's a failure, no fruit. 
And Jesus teaches this in many different ways. He talks about a man who called his servants one day and he gave them talent and he told them, go and, and get busy. I will come back and when I come back, I'll call you to find out how did you do with that which I have invested in you. And then when he comes back, he calls his servants and one said to him, you gave me five, I've, got, I've doubled it. You gave me two and I've doubled it. And then the one came and said, you gave me one. And I buried it. He had no fruits to show. He had no fruits to show. Read the story. And what did the master say? The master said, you wicked. That's a very strong word. In fact, that word wicked really doesn't really fit in the, the context of, of business. But he used the word wicked. Now, he, it's not that he wasn't a servant. It, it, it wasn't that he was not part of the team. It, it wasn't that he, that he didn't know the master. It wasn't that he didn't have a relationship with the master. He, he, his relationship was just as good as all the others. He was part of the family. He was a belonger. He belonged. That's why he was given like all the others was. That's why I say there are a lot of people in church today, they belong, but they're fruitless. They are a comer and a goer. They come and go, they come and go, they come and go, they come and go. They are. But the challenge that God has raised you, there's a purpose. The Christian life is the most challenging, most effective life that one can ever live. To the one who had no fruit, there was, a, there was a situation where Jesus saw a fig tree and he saw it was a luscious fig tree and he said, surely, surely there's some fruit in it. And he goes up to that fruit tree to eat some fruit and he found it, there was no fruit. On that tree. What did he say? If you turn with me to Matthew chapter 21, verse 19, this is what this is the experience Jesus had with this fruit tree. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves and said to it, Let no fruit on you ever again grow on you ever again. And what happened? It withered and died. It withered and died. Listen, if you're not bearing any fruit and you are fruitless, it's only a matter of time. You speak negative, you talk negative, you are critical because you are not doing what God wants you to do. And so the enemy fills your mind with everything that you see is wrong. Wrong about this and wrong about that and ugly about this and ugly about that. And you die. You die spiritually. You destroy your own self. So you say, Pastor, how can I be fruitful? How can I be fruitful? Jesus, in his beautiful illustration, taking nature, speaking about the vine of the branch, he says, listen, the only way the branch has fruit is when it abides. When it abides. What happens when the branch abides in the vine? The branch receives everything it needs for it to become fruitful. When it abides, when it has a love relationship, 
when it is, when it is being transformed and keeps that new, that life that it has in Jesus Christ alive by its relationship, by its worship, by by having the pleasure of enjoying the presence of God or, or being with God, then he pours within you all that you need for you to be fruitful. You say, yeah, pastor, really he does that? I'll show you. Your life begins to change. He, he, the, the thing that happens is this. It is not an outside change. It begins with an inside change. It begins with an inside change, not an outside change. If you will, if you will see, it is the vine that, that pours its substance into the branches when it's time for the branch to bear its fruit. Truth is a product of the vine. Say that again. The fruit is a product of the vine. People don't say, you know, this fruit is from the branch. No, this fruit is from the tree. It is this tree. This tree produces this fruit. It doesn't say this branch produces this fruit. No, the tree the fruit or the tree is being identified by the kind of fruit. The tree is identified by the kind of fruit it has. So it's the tree, it's the responsibility of the tree to make sure the branch has the fruit for the tree to be known. characteristics of the branch derives from the tree. And that's why if you turn with me to Galatians chapter 5, we've heard this many, many times, but let's look at it. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 and 23 says this, but the fruit of the Spirit, see? The fruit of of the spirit is what? Is love, is joy, is peace, is long-suffering, is kindness, is goodness, it's faithfulness, it's gentleness, it is self-control. Against such, there is no law. Wow. Oh, pastor, I'm not born to be loving, you know. I don't know how to love. Give you a knock on your head. <laughs> oh, pastor, my nature, you know, I don't know how to be gentle and kind. I won't be a branch. In the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him pour that which you don't have and he gives it to you. Do you know these three nine gifts can be put into three classifications? One is your countenance. Did you know that? The other is your conduct. And the last one is your character. These three gifts, these, these nine gifts can be put into these three, your countenance. Some of us really need our countenance to change. <laughs> now, what are these? How can, you, how can you put these nine gifts into these three uh, classifications or, or these three uh, divisions that affects us as a person? Number one is this, your countenance. What are the, what are the three gifts that that re relates to your countenance. Listen, love, joy, and peace is, is, can be observed. 
It's on the outside. People, people don't have to, people don't have to really get to know you, but people have to just see you and know that you are a joyful person. Is that right? You're a loving person. Your conduct is long-suffering kindness and goodness. Long-suffering kindness and goodness. They are characteristics of a person. You, you are able to have a behavior, a conduct. You're able to produce this kind of a lifestyle of knowing how to be long-suffering. Long-suffering is being patient. How many of you say, oh, I don't have patience. You need the vine. Be the branch. I don't know how to be kind. I don't know how to show kindness. I don't know how to be, how, how to show good. I don't know how to be good. You know, I'm, I'm always that, that, that person that you, among the family, you will call me the mean one. No, you don't have to be the mean one. You can be the good one. Somebody say amen. Learn to be a vine, learn to be a branch that abides. Let him pour into you his kindness. Our character, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Of course, this is not where I'm going. I'm just quickly running through with you of being a branch. You see, the branch... The branch is capable of having the, the countenance, of having the conduct, having a lifestyle that, that exemplifies whom? Jesus. So when people see you, when they taste of you as a fruit, when they taste your life, when they taste your life, they say, you come from a very good tree. What tree is this? It is a tree that Jesus says who he is. He says, I am the vine. You are the branch. I and the vine, you are the branch. You know the word Christian? Do you know how that word came about? It didn't come about by any one of us. It came about by those who saw the early disciples. And they saw the way those early disciples lived. And they saw the way the early disciples behaved. And they saw the way the early disciples conducted themselves. And those who saw them said, we recognize you. We recognize this kind of a lifestyle. We know somebody was somebody like you. We know someone who is like you. And they said, who? They said, there is one who is called Jesus Christ. We, and so by that they became Christians. Read your Bible, it tells you that. And people see you and fellowship with you. Do they say you're a branch of the vine?
because they see the characteristics of the vine of the branch displayed by the fruit. How many of you know no fruit tree eats its own fruit? Yeah? They don't. Whatever fruit that you are bearing, somebody else has to eat it, and they eat it, and they say what? Sour, sweet, very sweet. <laughs> what are they eating from you? Are they saying sour or sweet or very sweet? And you see, that doesn't come because you are a university graduate, a rocket scientist. That doesn't come that way. That comes by how? Being a branch, abiding in the vine. It is he who gives you the spirit. It's, it's, it's the fruit of the spirit that flows into your life and causes you to be. Well, I just cannot help but be kind. And then you would notice in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 to 11, and I'm going to read it to you. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be ignorant. Are you with me? Say an amen. I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren. You know that you were Gentiles carried away by these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore, I make known to you that no one speaking of the Spirit of God calls Jesus a curse. And no one can say that Jesus is Lord except the Holy Spirit is in him. Talking about your being saved and redeemed. And as a redeemed child of God, you recognize Christ as Lord. And then what else? And then it goes on to say, verse 4, there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are, differences, there are differences of ministries, the same Lord. There are diversities of activities, but the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one, is given to each one. The manifestation of the Spirit is given. The manifestation of the Spirit is given. The manifestation of the Spirit is given. You don't earn it. You don't try to produce it. You just be the branch. And there will be the manifestation. You be the branch. And there is the manifestation. Verse 7, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. Very strange word to be used there, but rightly so, profit, to prosper, to gain, to enrich everybody. Your giftings and your talents are not to be self-consuming and just for you to enjoy. If God has prospered you, listen carefully. If God has pros prospered you, listen. He prof prospered you for a reason. And that prosperity covers every area. Use your wisdom for the glory of God. Use your wealth for the glory of God. Use what you have that he might be glorified. For to one is given the word of wisdom, to another knowledge, to another faith, to another the spirit. I'm, I'm hurrying through, the other for healing, the other for working of miracles, the other is prophecy, the other is 
discerning of spirits, different kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues. Verse 11, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as the vine or as he wills. Who's he? The vine. The longer you abide in him, the vine determines how you not only have his character, but you have his work. There are a lot of people that go, oh, pastor, I'm not capable. I can't listen. The vine gives you the capability. He will gift you. What you need for you to serve. You're not in some area of ministry or serving. Listen, you are missing God's purpose for planting and placing you here. You are not meant to just warm a seat every Sunday. That's not your purpose. You are a branch. God has, God wants to gift you. Everyone is gifted. Oh, but pastor, I, I am a no gift person. He wants to fill you. You have his character. You do his work. And he has called us to be witnesses, missionaries of the kingdom of God. I'm closing with this last thought. And I still haven't finished. I'll come back and try to finish this up, but I'll close it with these thoughts. There's evidence when you are having his character. Love, joy, peace, you know, having that countenance, having his countenance, having his conduct, having his character, going about with his wor works as he has given you. Now, that's not the only gifts that he gives, there are many other gifts. There are gifts of administration. There's gifts of hospitality. There are gifts of giving. There are many other gifts. God wants to give you these gifts. And when that is happening, there's, there's evidence. There are at least four clear evidence that you are abiding. Number one is this. You, your lifestyle confesses that you are a believer or a belonger and that you demonstrate faith every day in different, different things. Not just faith, you know, for your faith promises. And that's why Calvary gives you an opportunity to trust God by giving faith promises. Faith promise giving is a tremendous way of learning how to live a life of a branch. Really. And when you know how to, how to make and give faith promises, you learn how to live the faith life that he has called you, not by sight. 1 John 2, 4 and 5 says this, he who says, I know him and does not keep the, his commandment is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whosoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. There, the love relationship, the love affair is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. There is a witness by your lifestyle when you begin to express his character, his works, 
in doing what God has called you. Number two, he has an unbroken fellowship with God. 1 John 2, 6 says this, he who says he abides in him or himself also to walk just as he walked. Who is he? Jesus. Jesus. He who says he abides in him. Who is him? Jesus. He who says he abides in Jesus or himself also to walk just as Jesus walked. And that's why we are called by his name because we have his spirit. We have his fruits. We have his works. We have his character. We have his conduct. And therefore, we exemplify, we testify. And that secret of doing that is learning to abide in him. When he abides, when you abide in him, listen, you're not an habitual sinner. I'll take a little time with this one because sometimes we don't understand. I said, when you are abiding in him, the evidence is this. You don't live an, an, a habitual sinful life. You don't live an a habitual sinful life. In other words, you, you don't keep continuing to live in a sin that, you know, you accept it as natural and you keep doing it over and over and over again. God delivered you from that. You're not a, you don't keep that same sin and keep sinning that same sin over and over again. Now, do you sin? Yes. You may fall into sin. You may fall back from time to time. You may, you may make some mistakes. You may, this, because we are still, how many, how many would raise your hand and say, you are a perfect human being since Jesus, since Jesus, you say, you anybody like that? Now, I'm not raising my hand. Why? Because we are still God's workmanship. God is still working in us. There are things in our lives that he's still working. We're not perfect. Oh, but pastor, you've got the fruit. Oh, yes, I have the fruit. Oh, but pastor, you have the gift. Oh, yes, I have the gifts. But listen, we're in this body. And that's why Jesus says if we confess our sins, and he, is, he wasn't talking to sinners. He was talking to the church. John was speaking to the Christian church. John was talking to believers. He says, now if you have fallen, if you have by the wayside as you, as you live for him, and somewhere down the line, it's not a habitually sinning the same sin over and doing nothing about it. No, you don't live that way. But if you do fall, And in your imperfections, learning to be more like Jesus and growing to be like Jesus. Come to him and he says this. If you, if you, if any man sin, if he will come and confess, he is faithful. I like that. He is faithful and just to forgive and to cleanse you. And he's talking about you. You say, oh, pastor. Yes, pastor. I, when I come to church, you know, I manifest the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I, I bring words of prophecy. I pray for people. They get healed. But after that, pastor, you know, there are things still in my life that is still, that I'm still working and believing for God's sanctification. I'm not perfect, Pastor. If we confess our sins, and you come, and you say, Lord, it's not something. I know it's wrong, and I care less, and I keep doing it. I just give lip service and I say, sorry, God. 
and tomorrow I keep doing it. Sorry, God, and tomorrow I keep doing it. Sorry, God, and I keep living that way. He says, no, I don't live that way. I say, sorry, God. I turn my back. Help me. That I may walk and live righteously. The evidence of living, abiding in him, the fourth evidence is our lives. We live in unity and fellowship with one another. We live in unity and in fellowship with one another. That's the fourth reason. Let me give you the four again. Number one, number one is we demonstrate faith every day. We have an unbroken fellowship with God. I'm a worshiper. I'm a lover. I'm in a love relationship with God. Number three, I don't live an habitual sinful life. Number four, I live in fellowship, in unity, with one another. And there are a number of scriptures that can go with it. But I'm going to close with this. What is the Lord saying to you this morning as we are getting ready to come to communion? What is the Lord saying to you? Sanctified to serve. If we are going to be fruitful in serving, we need to learn to abide. And if you're going to learn to abide, you need to take the teachings that Jesus gives us. He is the vine, I'm the branch. And this morning as he draws you, he draws you. He's, he's not condemning you. He's drawing you. He's saying to you, will you love me? Will you be that branch today and say, I want to abide in Jesus? I want to abide in Jesus. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I'm going to give you a little time. Ushers are getting, those helping me with communion are getting ready.